Hey everyone, and welcome to today's talk on ye re yeast repitching and troubleshooting fermentations. Uh, I'm Nate. Hi everyone. Hey guys, I'm Richard. <laughs> and we'll uh, we'll get straight to it. We'll jump straight into the presentation. Um, there's no announcements before we start, right? Uh, nope. Uh, I mean, check out our our brand new website if you haven't. Um, there's uh, a lot of cool stuff on there. Uh, these paintings behind us start to make a lot more sense when you when you see the uh, uh, new branding and design for some of the, the yeast strains that we've put up there. And there's, there's a lot more fun stuff to come. Um, keep your eyes peeled on Escarpment's uh, announcements. We've got three pretty big things coming up this month that we'll be announcing. So uh, we're going to try to keep things interesting in addition to some of this educational content. Yeah, we get to act. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah there's choreography <laughs> oh yeah it's gonna it's gonna be fun <laughs> uh but with that we will get get into it today so today we will be talking about there we go whoa has a uh yeast repitching and troubleshooting uh, so this is a huge topic that we could go into for hours and hours and hours. However, the issue here, and this is going to be a consistent theme throughout pretty much well this entire presentation, is that as soon as you start getting into the weeds with this, you start getting into specifics for each individual's facility. So my goal for today, and I want to stress this, is my goal for today is for you guys to understand the basic principles of this so you can then walk away and make more educated decisions within your own facilities. When it starts getting into the nitty gritty, we can help you get through all that stuff. We can help you kind of troubleshoot and fine tune this stuff. But the goal today is to give you guys the basic principles so you can then start improving some decisions within your own operations first. Now, in addition to that, I'm already assuming that you guys have gone through Yeast Basics 1 through 4. I'll be mentioning certain things, I'll be pulling certain things in from those lectures from time to time, just so you're aware. If you, haven't, if you have any questions or, or you know, don't know the backstory or the back, you know, uh, the back knowledge behind something, I'd recommend looking there first. If there's something more, we can, we can absolutely help you guys go through that. Now, when kind of going in through this topic and assembling all the different information, it, it became pretty pertinent to me that this is where we should start. You know, yeast cropping it has been it's so I, just inherently occurring in breweries. Like it's been happening in breweries since we called them breweries. It's one of the oldest practices we see in the brewing industry. Yet many, many modern breweries are having problems with it. Um, you know, that we've seen some breweries. I've seen brewers who will spend hours dwelling over hop recipes and then just throw yeast at it and say, cross their fingers and hope it works. Um, before we get into the weeds of actually talking about yeast repitching, I think it's really important to understand how we got here in regards to yeast pitching. Uh, because if you look at different ways in which other breweries handle their yeast or how breweries historically handled the yeast, this wasn't really a problem. And if we want to solve a problem, it's, it's best that we first understand it. So I think we, we, this is a good place for us to start. We're going to highlight the difference between kind of classic brewing methods or kind of maybe archaic brewing methods by modern standards and then kind of your modern contemporary brewing, stand, brewing methods for yeast handling. So we'll start with it. This essentially is the next chapter in how to win friends and influence yeast. Um, you know, yeast handling, it could be several chapters actually of this book. <laughs> uh, so if we go way back as far as, as we could, some of the earliest versions of yeast handling is these kind of wooden vessels. There's these stories about, you know, Vikings having their, their magic spoons and, and their, or their magic sticks that were used for fermentation, where essentially they'd stick it inside of a fermented beverage and it would start fermenting. Uh, we also see this sort of uh, system occur with kvike rings, which I'm sure some of, us are, some of us are very familiar with. The core message behind these, or the core kind of mechanism behind both these is exactly the same. You have a porous substance, would be in wood, that can grab onto microorganisms, and in many cases actually have large amounts of dried yeast attached to them. Um, most of the times when you hear people talk about these these methods, they were these these spoons or kvike rings were added near the end of fermentation to build up yeast onto them and then dried and used later on. This makes tons of sense, as this would be a way for yeast to survive from batch to batch to batch to batch. Um, if anyone is not sure what we're seeing here, so all this dried brown and kind of beige stuff all over the ring, that is that ring that is the yeast associated with it. You know, you'd put this, hang this up in a barn or on a wall until you need it the next time. Then when you need it next time, 
Once your wort's cooled out, you drop this inside of your, your vat of liquid that you're trying to ferment, and it'll dissolve and start fermenting. Now, there's a few things we should note about kind of these older style breweries, and that is something that somewhat of a mechanical limitation we have to be aware of. So if you look at this replication of, of an older, like a very, very old brewery, you'll notice one thing, or at least you should notice one thing, and that is other than the boil kettle, everything here, for the most part, is wood. And the reason for this is that until probably about 100, 120, 30 years ago, the ability to produce very large vessels made for brewing or any sort of food processing was very limited. You know, your mash tons were made of wood. You know, your hot liquor tanks were made of wood, usually fed with a boiling water system. Your fermenters are made of wood. Your casks you serve dispensing are made of wood. You, Christ, your, your, the thing you're drinking out of may have been wood. Um, metal didn't really exist in the way it does today. Like the idea of having large uh, CCVs, closed conical fermenters, uh, sorry, vessels, was not physically possible to manufacture. Uh, for a long period of time, if you start going into England for the porter breweries and things like that, they were limited by their boil kettle size. And these vessels were not by any means cheap. They were very expensive. So you see wood everywhere in these older breweries. Now, as I'm sure many of us are aware, wood is a great source for controlling, for containing organisms to it. So when you have a brewery like this that's using a certain yeast strain, this, is, this organism is going to be embedded in effectively everything. So when you're looking at these kind of older methods of brewing, yeast is literally in the building. It is, it's very difficult to get rid of. Now, once some brewers were looking to make larger fermenters, they started migrating to other different materials, mainly being concrete or slate. Uh, what you have here is a, a painted slate fermenter located in Belgium used for saison fermentations. Now, the benefit here is that you could make these vessels larger. You could theoretically make them larger uh, and other benefits, sorry, but the main benefit was mainly that of flavor. Uh, some people found that when you had slate fermenters or some concrete fermenters, they actually get embedded flavors into the beer. But again, these were great places for microorganisms to live. I want to point one thing out here is that all these vessels so far have been very shallow, and this is going to be an important part that we're going to highlight soon. So if we then start looking at larger scale lager breweries and things like that, you've probably seen this image before in other presentations I've given. It's one of my favorites. Uh, but what you'll notice here is that we have many of these shallow, relatively speaking, large, round, wooden lager fermenters. So what you'd often see in these, in these breweries is that one brew, one copper, so to speak, if, if you're using the, the kind of older terms, uh, would go and fill multiple smaller wooden fermenters that would be open fermented. So you'd have, say, all five of these, or these three tanks here at the front, all come from one same brew kettle. This was intended. The, you know, the, at this point in time, you didn't have the ability to create three or four story tall fermenters. So you took the one story fermenter by modern time and split it over three times the square footage. This is how we operated, how we operated fermentations. You had multiple or many smaller, shallower ferments. Now, if we look at different places in the world for this, this is the kind of classic Samuel Smith or just kind of English slate square fermenters. And this is where we start to see them start to get a little bit bigger. Uh, I want to just point out a few things here. You notice that these are all still, you know, right around waist or mid body height. Uh, they're all injected. All the wort is cast into these fermenters, which are usually called carp tails. You see them in all the different tanks. This is where the wort would be injected inside the tank. These, these breweries did not have wort aeration or things like that. These, is that, but that equipment what didn't physically exist. This is how you'd be introducing oxygen and things like that to these beers. So you'd have these beers you cast out. The nice thing about this, and this, we'll talk about this a little bit with top cropping, is that you could e very easily handle these fermentations by hand. You could physically get a bucket or a scoop and scoop off the good things or, or you know, get rid of the, 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 the bad parts. You can see kind of some, a little bit of trub found uh, accumulating right here in the middle of the, the picture on the left. Uh, this was a way for the brewers to easily manipulate these fermenters. Again, they're not tall. You didn't have the technology to make these things two or three stories tall. And the yeast liked it. The yeast much, you know, very much so enjoy this environment. Now, if you start going even larger, these are some of the, the open fermenters at Samuel Smith. And what, you'll, what you might notice, or what, what's going on here is not what we saw beforehand. Those were casting out. What these breweries would also often do is they'd pull liquid from the bottom of these fermenters and recirculate it from the top to the bottom, introducing small amounts of oxygen during the fermentation, enhancing yeast flavor profile, increasing yeast health, um, doing all sorts of positives for that yeast, and, and enhancing more flavors or imparting more flavors into the brew, things like that. 
these, this, the way in which these fermentations were handled is completely different than the way in which we handle modern fermentations, mainly because they had this mechanical limitation, but they took full advantage of it. And one of the ways they took advantage of it was for yeast cropping. So this is a common thing you see when it comes to old school um, English style fermentation. So what we see here is essentially a spoon. Uh, so you see it has some little grates on, on the top left, some of the little gear marks on it. They could raise or lower this device in or out of the fermentation. So oftentimes they'd have one or two of these instead of a vessel, and they'd be, use this to scoop up yeast as for top cropping. So this way you could add the scoop in, come back a few hours later, scoop the thing up, use that yeast fresh for your next fermentation, which is wonderful. Now you can also just use a spoon like this. This is from a small brewery in the U.S., where for top cropping, this is how they do all their yeast handling, which is kind of neat. And if you want to start looking at how this, this principle started to be applied for commercial brewing, what you have here is a schematic for the Burton Union style fermentation system, where you have all these barrels. You can see a row of barrels going back. These are usually, you know, these are many, many barrels deep. Each one of these barrels usually being three to 500 liters. They'd have a port in the side for filling. Uh, any sort of overflow or any sort of, you know, uh, spillage would go into the top, up through that swan neck and into a trough at the top, which would then be where all the yeast is collected. This yeast would then be collected as this trough is slightly uh, uh, beveled, slightly, slightly angled down, which would then be collected and then added to, a net, to the next large bulk fermentation, which would then be used to feed all these barrels in the side. When the barrel was thought to be finished, there'd be drain ports on all these barrels. They'd uh, sorry, discharge a large lot of these barrels into once into aging tanks or cast tanks or things like that, and then refill the system as they see fit. And another thing to note for these methods is that these were not exactly the most clean. Uh, you know, this is what you see on the left-hand side is one of these recirculations of that, uh, you know, pumping from the bottom of the tank and pushing it onto the top of the open ferment. This often causes a lot of CO2 to be liberated, causing a lot of foaming. Same thing goes on the right-hand side. That's a, an open fermentation occurring at Jolly Pumpkin Artists and Ales out in Michigan, um, where you know this open ferment every now and then just overflows. Uh, when I mentioned earlier that when you're working with this sort of this sort of system, the yeast gets everywhere, whether you like it or not. And the issue here is that when you start trying to work with multiple yeast strains, this becomes near impossible mainly because competition starts setting in and whichever one of your yeast strains is physically the most fittest, it will outcompete the other one and next thing you know, your multiple strains is no more. Now for all these brews, depending when, you know, regardless of when they were, um, once the beer is near f f finished fermentation, uh, they would then, all those open fronts would be drained into these large aging tanks. These could be wooden, these could be stainless, they could be glass lined, which if you want to hear some horror stories about uh, operational, look into glass lined tanks. Uh, if you really want to. Um, but this is where the beers would then be transferred near the end of fermentation, finish off fermentation, carbonate themselves up, and be ready for serving. And then through a large amount of technological advancements, we go from all of that open ferment into our modern style brewery. Now, I want to point out a few things here that are different. The biggest technological difference for this, and this is one of the things that really shook the industry, and in, I believe it was the late 70s, uh, when we start, start to see all the breweries start to kind of, kind of, uh, merge together, is these large closed conical fermenters that we see on the right-hand side. Um, the, ability to start, or the, the ability to start fermenting or manufacturing large stainless steel vessels like this completely changed the game. And that is what a large portion of what we're going to be talking about today is going to be about. Uh, now, the reasons for this change are numerous, are very numerous. So we're going to talk about, we're going to address those first. So when it comes to the, f the most, probably the most important reason for this is distribution. Now, historically, when you had large open, sc open scale fermenters and things like that, the beer is mainly being consumed locally, and which meant quite quickly. So a shelf life wasn't really a problem. Um, in, in situations where you did have global distribution, this is well documented with old ales and kind of export ales and things like that for England, they'd have to let the beer sit in barrel for a, for a decent period of time before shipping. And what's thought to have occurred, and we have microbial evidence to, to support this, that during this time, Britannomyces fermentations occurred. Now, this makes tons of sense because you have an open fermentation facility that's not exactly the most aseptic or even sanitary or you know, sterile by any means. Uh, so you're going to have multiple organisms fermenting. But if, you ha if your beer is being consumed quite quickly, you don't exactly have to worry about that. If your beer has to have a long shelf life, these open fermentation systems the error posed by these open fermentation systems is a little too much to bear, which is why we, one, of the, one of the things that pushed them into 
the, the CCP territory. Additionally, it's space savings. I mentioned this before with the big wooden vats. I, if I, you know, square footage is, is key for a lot, of, a lot of operational facilities. If I can have a tank that is three times as tall and still be structurally sound, that makes a lot more sense for me from a business standpoint. Again, pushing us further towards the modern methods of using CCVs and things like that. CCV is a closed conical vessel. Um, open fermentation also just takes up way more space. And on top of that, it's really messy, which means that you know, everything's going to get covered. We have to have sp spend a lot more money when it comes to cleaning and things like that. This just doesn't make sense. And additionally, this is more so of a modern issue, but variety of strains. When you're working with open fermentation, the strain is going to be absolutely everywhere. So it, it was physically and practically working with multiple different types of yeast. The CCV allows us to work with these different yeast strains. And finally, it's just consistency. You know, variability is less tolerable when you're going through a larger market with more competition. So this isn't exactly a possibility or something that we want to tolerate. All of things have led us to be in the situation we now are. You know, all these kind of modern, mo modern elements that kind of go against what yeast likes and what makes yeast happy are what we now have to deal with. This thing that was once really easy for, for brewers to handle and was never a problem that they had to deal with is now a big thing that brewers have to struggle with. So we're going to be ta 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 teaching you guys how to handle these things more, more in or at least give you kind of the rudiments to talk about these or make decisions more intelligently about it. So we'll talk a little bit about bottom and cone cropping, what it is, talk about kind of the layers of yeast that we often see talked about for it and give you some nuance and details around it. Talk about methods of how we can actually pull yeast out of these tanks and how we can manage it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about pitching yeast. We're not going to talk about pitch rates. We're talking about physically, how do I move the yeast from the bottom of the vessel into the next fermentation vessel? That's what, that's what we're talking about when it comes to pitching yeast. Talk about how to handle multiple fills and then also address a few things that can go wrong. And then finally, we'll go through some bits about where and when we should be checking different things during fermentation. Um, I will be referring you to a few different things in different presentations for that last part, but we're talking kind of about the Coles notes and like the high points for it. So with that, we'll talk about bottom cropping. So bottom cropping is now by far the most common method for cropping yeast by far. Um, every single conical vessel has it. The two vessels you see here in front of you are actually two of our propagators that we had made a, a, few, a year or two ago. Uh, in general, these issues don't, uh, how to put this? The, the, the issue with coast conical vessels are numerous, but they're all manageable. And this is why this technology has been maintained. All the things, all the issues that we see with this can be dealt with. You just have to understand how to deal with them. Oh. So the first thing we're going to talk about is this layer, so this idea of the layers, or I want to dispel this a little bit. Now, I am being a little bit hy little hyperbolic there. This isn't quite completely wrong, but I often find people, when they read about this and learn about this, they take away the, long, the wrong conclusion, or they don't understand the context around it. So in general principle, what you see here is a yeast cone where we have the trub yeast or dead yeast at the very bottom of the cone. We have the ideal healthy yeast in the middle, and then we have the poor flo flocculation or thin yeast on top. Now, these correlate with the, the quality of the yeast cells we're going to be working with. These trub yeast or dead yeast are exactly that, dead yeast. They're cells that during fermentation or, the, or some way through fermentation died, which means they're no longer producing CO2. So CO2 is what actually causes these cells to raise, rise, rise up through the ferment. If there's no longer any sort of motor force being the CO2 to push them up, they're going to settle down to the cone of the bottom first. So whenever we look at a yeast cone, we're always going to see these dead cells at the bottom first. Additionally, trub, which is just trub that we see as cold break or hot break, that does not, have any, does not produce CO2 because it's not alive, it's inanimate. So that is also going to settle to the bottom of the tank first. We always, no matter what we're working with, want to get rid of this portion of the yeast cone first. Now, afterwards, we have our, our, our ideal and healthy yeast. These are yeast cells that have settled when we wanted to. They settled at FG. They handled how we expected them to. These are the cells that are doing exactly what we wanted them to do. These are ideal or, and healthy yeast cells. And then finally, we have our poor flocculation or thin yeasts. These are yeast cells that more often than not have issues with their flocculation genes meaning that when they try to ferment, they try to flocculate out, they're unable to, or they, so meaning they settle at a slower rate. If a yeast cell has issues with its flocculation genes, it likely has issues with other portions of its genome, meaning that we typically do not want these yeast cells to continue on to the next batch. So when people look at this, you often get a really easy solution. It's okay, I want to dump the, the bottom portion of the yeast cells and not get to the top. 
this is where the context becomes important. This, all the research that was done surrounding this principle is all done on macro breweries using vessels that were very, very large, very, very large fermentations. We're talking hundreds of hectoliters large. And if you are working with a smaller vessel, you don't get the level of uh, the gradients forming as cleanly as you would expect. It just doesn't happen because of, because of the size. Additionally, if you have other flocculation issues or other harvesting issues, as we're going to address soon, the resolution on these will be further muddied. So what I would recommend you all do is that when you're trying to harvest yeast cells is that you always uh, dump the trub or the dead yeast. Always get rid of that. And then I wouldn't personally just try to sweat getting the rest of it or trying to make any sort of additional cuts. Uh, because if you're not working with anything, I'd say probably be, maybe 80 hectoliters or larger, you're probably not going to get the resolution. Or you're probably not going to pull off what you are intending to pull off. So with that, we'll kind of address the first big, the, the biggest issue that most breweries face when it comes to trying to harvest yeast cells off the tank, which is tunneling. Um, Elon Musk is not involved in this tunnel. Uh, so yeah, all we're looking for tunneling, or what, what occurs with tunneling is often when someone opens the valve at the bottom of the tank, this creates a large negative pressure environment right at the bottom, which then causes everything directly above this portion of where the valve is located to all of a sudden collapse in on itself. So cre essentially creating a sinkhole through your yeast bed. Now, this is by no means what we want. This is not ideal by any means for two reasons. The first one is that we're not actually going to get the proper amount of yeast cells out of this fermenter that we need. We, you can see this from this diagram. There are large volumes of yeast that are still left inside this tank. So we're going to pull through this ideal yeast, start collecting this kind of non-ideal yeast, and then we're going to start having beer come all the way through. So we're going to collect a little bit of yeast, but it's probably not, it's not often enough. Now, some of you might be thinking, this is the other part, the second part, that this is fine, we're just gonna tunnel and I'll drain off all my beer. It's not so fast. Uh, once we start having all this beer rocking through, say I set up a transfer and I move this beer from tank A to tank B, because I have this large amount of flow going through, I'm going to start eroding all the different sides of this tank. I start eroding some of the channels that hold some of these chunks of yeast and all of a sudden I'm gonna have a large yeast chunk go into this transfer line. Now, I have been in this situation more times than I'd likely like to admit, but you're trying to do something like this, and all of a sudden your pump gets a large chunk of yeast on yeast thrown into it, and it's sometimes your your pump doesn't like pumping that, and you start having a lot of problems. Um, or if you're in the middle of a filter run trying to do something like this, all of a sudden your filter is blinded and you have to restart. Uh, this is not a situation where you want to find yourself in. <clears throat> not something I recommend you, you try to do. So how do we avoid this? How do we avoid tunneling? Now, this is probably the biggest issue you see breweries face, so how do we avoid it when it comes to yeast cropping? Now, the main way we avoid this is mainly through less crashing. Uh, and this has a lot to do with the viscosity and, the, and the, the manual properties of the yeast cake that we're working with. In general, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the yeast flow more so. We don't want putty. We want it to flow like, um, like a smooth paste out of the tank. Now, typically what, how this occurs is through, or this, this kind of pasting, or this, this uh, Play-Dohing, excuse me, of the, of the yeast occurs is through too much cold crashing. So I'll go through a few different ways in which we can address that. Too much cold crashing might seem like a good thing because if we cold crash the tank more, we're gonna, get, we're gonna drop more yeast cells out of the liquid, which means that our beer will become clearer at the top, which is correct. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying that's not correct. That is absolutely correct. Our beer will be clearer but it'll be more difficult for us to pull our yeast off that tank because instead of working with a nice smooth paste, we're now working with putty. I have had situations where the, the yeast cells have been flocked so hard that you open the bottom of the tank and nothing comes out. And you're looking at this 80 hectoliter tank above you and you know there's a lot of pressure in there and that yeast isn't going anywhere. So this is a situation where too much cooling was applied or the yeast cells were allowed to sit and settle in that tank for too long of a period. The solution to this is actually quite simple. And it, all it is, is that you need to consistently, at a certain time point, pull yeast cells off of it. To give you an example for Cali, the California ale, uh, usually about two to three days of cooling at about zero to four degrees Celsius, that is when most, most brewers find is the ideal time to pull Cali off a fermenter. That way it's not too hard, it's not too pasty, it flows out of the tank quite nicely, and you can minimize tunneling because you don't have this rocky, putty-like structure you're trying to pull out. It is still flowable. 
Now, depending on your facility and your, and your fermentation uh, geometry and things like that, you may find that one day is fine, two days is fine. It all depends on what you're working with. This is where we start getting into the weeds of, you know, the, of uh, different facilities requiring different steps. There is a decent amount of trial and error associated when it comes to pulling yeast cells off the tanks. And this is based on a myriad of factors inside your facility, things like the degree of polish inside the tanks and the pitch rate and the air, all sorts of different factors for it. Now, one common method you see some NEPA, NEPA brewers, New England IPA brewers, uh, Implore, sorry, uh, implement in order to kind of harvest enough yeast cells is this. So they'll ferment their beer as normal, and then right near the end of fermentation, they'll partially cold crash their beer to 8 to 14 degrees Celsius, right near the end of fermentation. And the idea here is that you're going to slow down fermentation, you're going to cause CO2 to become more soluble, and you're going to start causing some of the yeast cells to start flocking out, and flocking out not really hard, but kind of loosely and softly. At which point, we then, after about 20, you know, 24 hours or so of this cold crashing, we then pull our yeast off. The yeast cells can flow nicely out of it. We're, gonna, we're not going to get any yeast cells sticking to the sides because it's overflocked. It's not going to become putty-like. It often just flows easily out of the tank. At which point, once the yeast cells are harvested, we then add our dry hops to this tank. Makes our life real easy. We don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Our hops are in there. The hops aren't going to damage the yeast cells we want to harvest because the, hops, the yeast is already harvested. This works real well. And this does work really well. There just is one problem, and that's this. I may have mentioned this beforehand, but what you're adding when you do these things, this is a very common method for producing NEPAs, which is why I'm talking about it, is you now have a substance that has a large amount of dissolved CO2. And for anyone who's poured a beer into a glass and seen the little bubbles raise from the bottom up to the top, is that those little parts of the bottom of the glass are nucleation sites. So when we add, we add a carbonated beverage to nucleation sites, more bubbles rise through. It's the same reason why we're for, uh, for boil. Bo the same reason why we often see boil overs occur when we add hops when we're in uh, during the hot side. This can happen with the fermenter too. If we we add a bunch of hops to our to our fermenter at eight to fourteen degrees Celsius, we have a large volume of substance that has some residual CO two inside of it, and we're adding a large amount of nucleation sites in the form of hops. This can happen. If you do this, and this can be very dangerous, you know, if that geyser of beer comes at you, you're essentially drowning in beer and you're on a ladder or a skyjack or, you know, you're in a precarious situation. This could be very dangerous. So there is another option for this. There is another way you can choose to handle this. And this is somewhat NEPA specific. So in this situation, your beer is fermented as normal. The beer is then transferred. This is the important part. The beer is then transferred to a new clean fermentation vessel with the dry hops often already added in it. And this is, the, this is the benefit, is that as we transfer this beer onto it, the hops are already in the tank. If there is foaming, we have an entire tank for, the, for that foam to, to take up the space in. Makes our life really, really easy and really safe. Now, we're taking all this beer off our source tank via the racking arm, which leaves at the bottom of that tank all the nice yeast cake at the bottom. And what you often see people do at this point is you can rouse that, uh, rouse that yeast cake together with, with sterile CO2, homogenize the whole thing, and at this point, drain off nice, easy, high quality, large volume uh, amounts of, of culture ready for you to use. This method works great, and I would implore you to try it out, but there's a big issue with it, and that is that it requires you to have a new tank to transfer this out into. Not everyone has this this is available to them. If you do have it available to you, it works great. But if you don't, you know, the first method is probably where you're going to end up lying. You can choose your own adventure on this. So, uh, and one just kind of big note about harvesting yeast cells, because this is somewhat frustrating, but it's also very important, is that not all yeast strains handle the same way. I mentioned before that Cali is usually two to three days post cold crash for harvesting. If we were working with an English ale strain, it's going to be like zero to one days for harvesting because that stuff becomes putty because it flocks really, really tightly. Um, every single strain is going to be a bit different. Every single brewery is going to be a bit different. Um, as the local yeast labs, we can help you, you know, you know, figure this whole thing out, but you cannot assume that every single yeast strain is going to, going to be handled the same way. They're all going to have their own quirks and corks that you have to you know, work your way through. No way around it. Now, this then brings us to yeast springs. We're now harvesting the yeast cells out of our tanks. So what do we harvest them into? A yeast spring. Now, a yeast spring is just any vessel, and I do mean any vessel. Literally, we'll talk about, we'll see that soon. 
uh, that is sanitary or able to be sanitized, uh, easy to keep cold between 0 and 2 to 4 degrees Celsius, easy to pump from or just to dispense from, uh, easy to determine adequate pitching amounts, uh, devoid of any oxygen, easy on the yeast, meaning no shear stress, so pumps are typically right out. Uh, the, the certain pumps like rotary lobes that work really well, but we don't want a centrifugal pump moving any sort of liquid like this, or sorry, any sort of yeast like this. And often the ability to have zero positive head pressure when not desired. So it's, it's able to vent excess pressure that's, that is released from the yeast. Now, all the vessels we're going to talk about have pros and cons. There is no perfect yeast vessel for this, and every single one is going to be appropriate for your facility and based on the design of your facility. So we'll go with the simplest one first. It's a bucket. It's not fancy. Now, to give you an idea of the scale, I believe this the brewer on the right is from West Mall. Don't correct, don't correct me on that. I could be very wrong on that. So don't take me on that. I, I could be very wrong. Uh, but you'll notice here that he's essentially just using a large stainless bucket to top crop the yeast. That's it. Um, there are some very noteworthy breweries, as we see soon, that literally use plastic buckets for their yeast cropping. This does not have to be fancy. You can make this as complicated or as simple as you want. Now, if based on the design of your brewery, a bucket is not appropriate, which is most, the next thing where you see most breweries uh, migrate to is a stainless corny keg. And in this case, some cases, this is just a Cornelius keg or a soda keg or a, you know, any, any sort of home brewing keg. Oftentimes retrofitted with a tri-clamp valve and then silicon hosing going to the bottom. You can fill this entire bad boy with, with PAA or something like that, soak the whole, all the soft parts in it, fill, the, fill the, the keg full of your yeast, and then pressurize with CO2 and inject it into your, into your fermenter. The first yeast brinks I worked with were these, and I can attest from my experience with it, they work great. They're not perfect. They don't, they're not appropriate for all, all industries, but for a lot of applications, they work pretty well. Now, the upgrade from that is the modified Sankey keg, which you see on the right-hand side, where the, the top of that keg, the Sankey coupler, is removed. Usually a three- to four-inch tri-clamp fitting is welded on top of it, which then, a which, in addition to a series of other fittings, uh, are added. We'll see some examples of this soon. And then past that, you have the custom-built pressure, you know, custom purpose built bioreactors that are meant for yeast. We have a lot of these as, as a lab. Um, this is what we this is what we use. Oftentimes they'll have certain features. You know, some ours obviously don't have removable lids, but some of them have removable lids, sterile air injectors, cooling jackets, temperature probes, all all the things you'd want in a good yeast brink. And you can go pretty elaborate with these devices, all the way to automated cell counters and load cells and all sorts of cool things for automation. So let's look at a few. Um, a few different options out there. Oftentimes you see some breweries using some kind of what I would describe as janky methods, but they work. Uh, on the left-hand side, it's just a modified Sankey keg that has some casters added onto it. For this vessels like this, you're just pumping yeast inside of it or pouring yeast inside of it from a tank and then putting head pressure on and injecting it into the next vessel. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see a small about two-heck vessel that's just designed for yeast. Dump yeast inside the top manually or pump it in, pressurize the whole thing, and eject it into the next tank. It's, you know, it's not, uh, not super complicated. There's also some retrofitted equipment people use. The one on the left-hand side is a retrofitted bioreactor. Um, these are always kind of, you know, heavily depends on the initial design and quality of the vessel. The one on the right is the same thing. It's, it's a repurposed version of, uh, I can't recall exactly what it initially was, but there's a, you can buy them online. I don't know if I recommend it, though. And then you see some larger versions that are repurposed Sankeys. The one on the left-hand side is, you know, just a, a Sankey, an upgraded Sankey with a bottom port for, with a two-inch TC fitting and then some ports on the top so you can do CIPs and things like that on it. And then you even have ma other manufacturers, lar you know, in, in enlarging Sankey kegs and putting them on casters for, uh, for use for these things. How you want to do this is very variable. It really depends on what you are trying to get out of this process and how you want to manipulate it. Now, there are a few things that you should keep in mind when considering what vessel you want to work with, and that's where we're going to take this next. Oh yes, and right, and some people will even just take the, have, have lobbed off the top of corny kegs and welded them, on, welded them on top of sankey kegs. I don't understand this, but I've seen them a few of them. I don't understand it. Uh, now when it comes to kind of the pros and cons of eats, I mentioned that they all have their pros and cons. Uh, buckets, whether they're plastic or metal, 
they're very easy to pour from. So if you if you do have kind of that, that shallow, waist-tight open fermenter system, these work great. And this is how you typically see most open fermenter breweries using, sorry, handling yeast. They're not often storing yeast in large brinks. They're often just keeping the yeast in, in sanitary buckets. Plastic buckets are obviously harder to sanitize and should be refurbished or you know, recycled every now and then. But for the most part, they work fairly well as long as they're used quickly. Uh, the, the easily purged of O2, if, if, you don't, if you leave that yeast out for any longer than, say, 24 hours, you're going to start having O2 permeate, and it's going to start causing problems. The modified kegs, you know, you obviously can't pour from a yeast brink a modified keg, but you can easily inject from them. You can easily pressurize them. They're easy to sanitize, often if designed properly. Easy to purge of O2. You can usually dispel the head pressure quite easily. Like these, can be, these can be quite useful. They don't have, oftentimes, they don't look great, but they, they're very functional. Now, to use a bucket as a fermenter, and I mentioned before that there are some very, very large breweries that use buckets for handling yeast, which sounds somewhat odd, but also very romantic in a strange way. Uh, this, is, this setup works great mainly for open fermenters, but if you want to use them with a CCV, you can. You just have to be aware of a few things. Now, if you do want to do this, you, all you have to do is make sure you bring your yeast and you have sorry yeast up on either a ladder or a skyjack and safely inject it in. Sorry, safely dump it in. Now, I personally have some some issues with doing that. I personally wouldn't want to be on a ladder with a twenty liter bucket of yeast dumping it into a fermenter a story and a half off the ground. I don't I don't want to do that. Um, but this is one of the reasons why you see a large amount of tanks have side manways, where if you have a side manway at you know, body height, you can simply open the manway, pump, dump the yeast in, seal it back up, and your yeast is inside the tank. Now, one really important thing to note here, because we've had a few clients have this issue, if you are doing it this way and you're adding your yeast cells to your, to your vessel first, you need to make sure that you have your cooling on before you cast your wort out. Otherwise, you will cook your yeast cells. We have had some clients where this has been a problem. Um, where you know they cast their wort out, usually they ca start casting out hot, and then they dial in the temperature, cold, you know, colder, bringing it from you know, say 100 degrees Celsius down to like 20 degrees Celsius for whatever they're trying to ferment, not realizing that they now have boiling, effectively boiling liquid, 50 liters or so, with 50 liters of yeast inside their fermenter, and they just pasteurize their ferment, all their fermentation organisms. This has happened to a few clients. I just really recommend that if you're going to do this with a side manway, especially. Make sure you you're, uh, you have your cooling on first before you cast out. Now there are some also breweries that you will use a, a kind of custom device that implements the, the Ventruli effect. Um, I have never seen one of these vessels off the shelf, but I have seen a few that have been custom made. The idea here being that you have some sort of restriction inside of your pipes. Often you have some sort of bucket or large funnel attached to the middle port. At which point, as the flow goes through, it pulls the yeast cells inside a, in, into the solution. This does work quite well. Um, I've never seen an off-the-shelf model of this, but this, this is something that's fairly easy to mock up. And when it comes to large breweries, you can just use buckets. Um, I mentioned large breweries. This is Anchor Brewing, the Anchor Brewing in California, Anchor Steam manufacturer, and they still to this day use buckets to inoculate their open fermentations, which is how they ferment most of their beer. Um, this is, you know, it doesn't have to be, it's not sophisticated, it's not complicated. This can be a real simple, easy way to handle yeast inside of your facility. But again, they've put the infrastructure and they designed this facility for open fermentation, not CCV fermentation. Now, if you are working with CCVs large, and you, you do need to inject your yeast cells, you effectively have two main ways to do so. Uh, when I say ways, I mean kind of ways to control or calibrate this. And those are by volume and by weight. We're going to take a quick walk through each. Now, by volume is easily the easiest way to do this. But there are some issues. Stainless steel kegs, whether they are yeast brinks or ones for drinking, we can't look inside of them with normal human capacities and determine the volume inside of it, which is not possible to do so. So if you are going to be using volume, it is best to use the entire keg or the entire vessel. It's not exactly easy to say, I want to, I want to use half of this keg to inoculate this, this next fermentation with. It really should be the entire vessel, vessel's volume. So this is why you often see breweries say, hey, I'm going to inject four kegs of yeast into this next beer. Or you know, this, this brand of beer for this fermenter gets two kegs worth of yeast. The whole volume should be used if you want to have some sort of consistency. 
Um, yeah, it, it can be kind of frustrating to work with, but it works quite well. Now, this is how it would look, and I'm I was trying to find the uh, the brewery that this is located for. I can't find it. If anyone is aware of what brewery this is, please let me know. This, these are slides that are sorry pictures that are from their website. I just could not find it today. Uh, but what, we, what they have here is the tank that has just recently been cold crashed. Uh, they have a nice sanitized hose at the bottom with that, where they're filling their yeast brink full of their slurry. They do a cell count on it, make sure everything's as they, as they see fit. Uh, this is their cast out line, so they have the wart coming in from the left-hand side, the sterile air injector on the right, top right, you know, just a little flow meter to make sure that all the air is actually going through so they can dial their regs in. And this valve on the bottom left is where the yeast is going to get injected. Sanitize the whole thing, attach the valve, Head pressurize the keg itself that, that contains the yeast, open the valves, and inject the yeast. It's that simple. It it's, doesn't have to be more complicated than that. As long as you know what the yeast cell, the cell count is, and even if you don't know what the cell count is, I will look at you strange, but it's this, work, this method works quite well. Now, if you do want to go with the weight method, and I'll give you an example of where you'd want to work with weight. Often breweries will have, say, say your Molson Coors or, or that, you know, even a smaller size brewery than that. You will often have centralized yeast storage where a, a yeast brink is filled. You know, the entire yeast cone from a certain fermenter will be brought into this yeast brink. And then they will meter out certain portions of that yeast brink into different fermentations. So they're not using the entire volume of the brink. They're only using a portion of it. Now, much like I said before, because we can't look inside the vessel, the only way for us to determine how much we're expelling is weight. And oftentimes, the way in which this is done is through what we call load cells. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a digital scale at home, this is what they're using. Essentially, the more force that's applied down, the stronger the electrical signal coming out is, giving it the ability to meter weight. Uh, you can much more easily pit, dial in pitch rates for things like this. Oftentimes, you see load, load cells implemented in systems where PLCs or computer systems automation is implemented. So this is often a big technological step up that a facility will go through when they start looking at, uh, at this. So that kind of brings us with, to, that kind of wraps up uh, different ways to actually get yeast inside the tanks. Now it comes to how we actually, or when we should be adding the yeast inside these tanks. Uh, this has to do with mainly with how we actually fill the vessel. Uh, most brewers are probably aware that you're often putting two, three, sometimes even four fills from the brew house into a single fermentation vessel. And this can often cause problems when brewers start trying to figure out when I should add my yeast, how I should handle my yeast, how I should handle my oxygen, all the different stuff for the, vessel, for the fermentation. So some general rules for this. You never aerate wort unless, unless it is, will immediately contain, sorry, imminently contain yeast. If you add oxygen to wort and there is no, no yeast present, you are just oxidizing the wort. That's it. They're not adding quality to it. You're just oxidizing it. You're oxidizing the beer. Don't do that. Additionally, never let wort sit in a fermenter uninoculated for more than 12 hours, ideally six hours, ideally less. You should always have wort, from, uh, wort present in a tank with yeast. If you don't, this is a great place for contaminations to occur, environmental. And those can be some really nasty organisms that we don't want present uh, in our beverages. Never pitch yeast multiple times throughout a fermentation unless something's being corrected for. That's the asterisk there. Um, you never want to add, say, for, with every single cast out, add, inoc add an inoculation of yeast. You always want to add your yeast in one single shot. And this last part is very controversial, and I would say it's likely incorrect. Because uh, and I would rec I would have recommended brewers break this rule multiple times. This is kind of an old school macro brewing adage that you do not want to aerate cells that are in the middle of fermentation. I would disagree with this. It's kind of old school macro brew no macro brewer knowledge that I think does some people a disservice. I'm going to be breaking that rule, but you will often see that being highlighted as a rule when it comes to how to handle yeast for fermentations. Uh, now, what, if we're filling a tank in the same day, there are a few do's and don'ts that we want to follow for this. The do's, add all your yeast for all of the fills on the first cast out. So if I know that within a 12-hour day, I'm going to cast four warts into tank T, it's a tank three, I'm going to want to be adding all my yeast on the first cast out. And I, when I mean all my yeast, I mean all the yeast for all the fills that day. Additionally, I'm going to want to try to aerate that first batch as heavily as possible, that first one. You could potentially aerate the second one. I probably wouldn't do it as, as aggressively, Excuse me, but you want to aerate that first pitch whenever you add the yeast really, really aggressively when you're doing multiple fills. 
a few don'ts. Add yeast with every fill. What you essentially have here is you have different, different sets of, the, of the yeast cell population in different stages of the fermentation, which means that the first pitch you add may, will have different in, uh, nutrients available to it than the other pitches you have. And in worst case scenarios, you can have yeast cells that are trying to consume glucose while the other one is, has just finished it up. And the yeast cells don't work as a cohesive unit, and it doesn't, it doesn't, tends not to work well. There are some papers on this if you want to go into that level of detail, but this is not something that I would recommend you do. I would also recommend that you don't aerate every fill for the most part. There's some strange exceptions to this, but we're not going to get into that. And as I mentioned beforehand, please make sure that if you're casting out your second wort or your third wort or your fourth wort, make sure it's going into the fermenter initially at colder temperatures. Make it colder and then let it ramp up a little bit. Otherwise, you might cook the cells that are already in there. One thing important thing to note here is that yeast cells at the beginning of a fermentation, they will be added to the tank and then they will settle to the bottom of that tank start waking up, get out of their lag phase, go into the exponential, sorry, into the acceleration phase. But that occurs locally at the bottom of the tank, in the cone. If we cast our wart out into that cone and it's freak it's screaming hot, that can send, that can be hot enough at the bottom of that tank to cook those cells, even though the overall average temperature didn't actually get hot enough to pasteurize them. It's not a thing you want to do. Just make sure all your wart coming when it first gets to the tank is at temperature. Now, if we're going to be filling the tank over two days, there are a few things we have to adjust here. And the biggest one here is, is in regards to the uh, yeast cell pitch rate. You want to add all the cells to that fermenter based on how much wort is going to be in there by the end of that day. So if I'm going to be casting two warts out today and then two warts out tomorrow, I'm probably shooting to have two warts worth of yeast being added to that tank on day one with full heavy aeration on the first one. The reason for this is that overnight, within 24 hours, those yeast cells should have multiplied and grown, which means that those yeast cells will now have enough will now have no, now have enough yeast cells for the next next day. This is, and I want to point this out, a non-ideal scenario. Ideally, you do have all of the yeast cells and all the warts in a fermenter by the same on the same day. If you go to macro brewers, they have a rule, but most of them have a rule. Let's just say the I'm not going to say not a name name brands or breweries or things like that. But they often have that the fermenter can only be as large as three of our brew houses and all the wort has to be in that fermenter within 12 hours. That way, they always know that all the yeast is there. All the yeast is happy. You don't have to have, you know, you don't have to worry about where the tank is the next day when you're casting the next wort. It makes their life a lot easier and for good reason. A few things you don't want to do. You don't want to be adding yeast with every fill. You don't want to be adding yeast on day one and then adding yeast on day two. That's a horrible idea. You're going to have different portions of the cell population trying to do different things that's not going to go well. Again, if you're trying to correct something at that point, that's a different state, but for the general, you don't want to be doing that. And you don't want to be casting out you know, things hot. That's really about it. Now, some common issues that can happen with yeast pitching. Um, there are many things that can go wrong. Don't get me wrong. There are many things that can go wrong with this. Um, but most of these kind of break down into two main categories, being old or poor health yeast, and then low sterile content for yeast, being the second one. Now, micronutrients will play a role in this. However, I often find that that just kind of buffers the other two issues above out, makes them less of an, less of an impact. If you can solve those two issues beforehand, you're going to have the micronutrients will have even more of a beneficial impact on preserving the quality of the cells you're working with. So we're going to go to the data. Uh, so we'll walk through these two different charts we see here. Excuse me, graphs. Now, on the left-hand side, what we see here is the impact of cooling or the impact of temperature on the glycogen content of a yeast cell. Now, glycogen is very important. Glycogen is, is the, uh, the, the food source that the yeast cell has to keep itself alive. And it's analogous to the human's fat. It's what, if, we, if we don't have access to food, this is what the yeast cell is going to use. Now, when we're storing our yeast cells, this is what they're going to be working with. They're going to be consuming just their glycogen. Now, we will often get the question or the, you know, the scenario, hey, I've had my yeast in the fridge in the walk-in for three weeks, two weeks. Is it still okay to work with? The answer is it's hard to tell. It really depends on what situation it was, what its glycogen content was to begin with. Uh, you know, what state the cells are in, and also what cell line it is. Certain cells handle storage far better than other cell lines. If you look at glycogen, this is the main reason why, or we believe to be the main reason why. Over time, the glycogen concentration will decrease, and as we will see soon, glycogen is very important. The amount of glycogen present at the beginning of fermentation is important. And as you can see here from the left graph, 
the colder we can keep these cells, the more glycogen is preserved. This is why we want to keep our yeast cell cultures cold while we're in storage. Now on the right hand side, we see the impacts of oxygen. So on the black line, we have aerobic. On the, on the white kind of squared line, we have uh, anaerobic. And you can see that when these both are held at six degrees Celsius, we see the anaerobic cell, so the anaerobic culture maintain its glycogen content to a much higher degree. Now, for both of these, both the left and right graph, you'll notice that the glycogen concentration is always going down. This is why it is always best to try and use your culture as soon as possible, always as soon as possible. That's not always possible to do so, so this is, you know, sometimes you're rolling the dice a little bit. It's, hard to, it's, it's just hard to call. Now, this one final graph I want us to look at is why glycogen is important. So glycogen, again, it's this food source that we see uh, the yeast cells maintain themselves on while they're in storage. But there's also a direct correlation between glycogen content and sterile synthesis. Now, sterols are very, very important for yeast cell health. Sterols are the thing that, that, that uh, influence what we call membrane fluidity. And membrane fluidity is the, is the ability for the membranes, proteins, to shift around the outside of the cell. So this means that if, if the sugar is on one side of the cell and not the other, the membrane proteins can shift all the way around. The more sterile content the cell has, the easier it is for the yeast cell to also bring in food from its environment, bring in sugars from its environment, bring in fan from its environment. We want our yeast cells to have a high sterile content. It makes them far more healthy. This is where the catch is. As you can see here, it's hard to see on the left-hand side of this graph, but the glycogen content starts quite high. And then as soon as fermentation starts, it plummets down and the sterile concentration spikes. This is because a large portion of this glycogen, the carbon associated with the glycogen, it actually goes towards sterile production. An unfortunate situation here is that the lower the, the initial glycogen concentration is, the lower our sterile concentration is going to be. So if I have a culture that's super fresh, really high glycogen concentration, I'm going to see a high amount of sterols being produced inside that cell line. However, I have a culture that's been sitting in my cold room for two weeks. It's not the, ha not the happiest cell to begin with. Its glycogen concentration is going to be much lower, which means that the sterile concentration it produces at the beginning of that fermentation will also be much lower. That we reproduce this four or five times, and all of a sudden our glycogen concentrations are not nearly as high as, the, as we want them to be. Our sterile concentrations are much lower than they should be, and we, pr we have produced an unhealthy cell line, an unhealthy culture. That's why we want to use our cells as quickly as possible, always as quickly as possible. We want to keep the sterols high, keep the glycogen high, keep the cells going. Makes our life easy. Now, when it comes to top cropping, one of the big benefits in a certain way of top cropping is that we cannot store our yeast cells for long periods of time. And what we end up seeing is that the sterile concentration, glycogen concentrations stay high. You know, you're, you're, you're pulling yeast cells off one open ferment and dumping them into the next one. It's the sterile and glycogen concentration are always high. The sterile concentration is also heavily influenced by oxygen concentration. That's actually one way we can bump up these sterile concentrations by adding more oxygen, but we have a talk on that later. Um, if with an open fermentation, you're adding more oxygen constantly, so we see the sterile concentration maintain very, very high levels, which makes for overall healthier yeast cells. With a CCV, we have to fight with this. We have to balance this. You know, we have to make sure we stay on course because if we, you know, a small five degree, you know, variance now, after five minutes, we're not very much, we're not off course by a large degree, but after four hours, we're very much so off course. After many fermentations, this, can, this is where we start getting into some, some problems. As a generality, freshly cropped yeast cells are going to have a higher glycogen trehalose content concentration, a lower lag phase, lower chance of off flavors, lower chance of under attenuation, higher chance, sorry, uh, more diastasis aldehyde reuptake, lower higher alcohol production and greater cell viability. Stored yeast essentially is the direct inverse. Uh, you want to use these cells as soon as possible to keep their health as high as possible. Keep those gly glycogen as high as possible. Make sure the sterile concentration it produces can be as high as possible. You know, be, be nice to these cells. Now, one last little bit we're going to talk about is fermentation monitoring. Um, and this is, this is the same kind of the QC world, which is quality control, that QC only costs you money until not having QC costs you lots of money. Uh, QC, say if you're a brewery and you have a recall, you could have caught the thing that caused the recall if you had a QC department, but now because you don't have a QC department, you're spending tons of money on a recall. Oftentimes, the preventative measures are cost far less than the uh, reactive measures. Now, 
from my experience, many brewers will get the cells into the tank and then stop paying attention to them. They'll get the cells, they'll figure out what the pitch rate is, and then they will not check it again. And I would argue that this is a mistake. Now we're going to go over some of the things you should do to ensure that your fermentation is doing what you think it's going to be doing. Now, there's no way, it, we should not just assume that it's doing what we want. Now if there's one test I would recommend you guys do, and this might seem a little bit odd until I, until I explain it, is that the test I think you should do is a cell count 24 hours into the fermentation. So hear me out on this. If we inoculate one trillion cells per hectoliter of wort at time zero, it is, it is a, good, a fair assumption that 24 hours later, all of those cells are now inside of fermentation. They should have all gone from their log phase, they should have gone through acceleration phase, and they should be in the early stages of exponential growth phase, which means they probably haven't grown yet, but they should all be starting to consume the sugars in their environment. If we don't see this, this means that something has gone wrong. But because it's so early in the fermentation, we now have time to correct the course. I said before, but you know, if you're doing any sort of navigation, you get five degrees off. That doesn't seem like a big thing at time zero, or in this case, time 24 hours in. But several days later, this is a big problem. Same thing goes here. We now have a time to correct 24 hours in, and we can now correct this beer. So. At this point, we can either we have a few options. This is going to be based on what this what we're seeing at that time at the 24-hour point. We can charge it with more oxygen. If the yeast cells all kind of look alive, just kind of sluggish, hit them with some more oxygen. It probably bumps them up a little bit, gives them a little boost. I probably would not repitch these cells again. I'd probably scrap this culture. But this is absolutely something we can do. If your cells are completely dead, and sometimes this happens, sometimes this, this can be a, a situation where you get false, uh, false negatives in regards to your cell count. You may have done a, a, a methylene blue stain or something like that, and you, your culture may have looked 70% or 90% viable, but it's actually 20. This happens. Um, this would be a great time for us to add more culture to it, re-yeast this beer, let it get rolling. Uh, additionally, sometimes when you add yeast to a fermentation, the osmotic shock just going from you know, a low, low viscosity environment to say 1060 wort, that can be enough to stress the cells out, causing them to lice, causing the cells to rupture. This could be a situation where a, what seemed to be a high, viabil high viability culture can actually get quite low. And additionally, the last bit, you can just rouse the culture. Sometimes this can be a slow-acting yeast cell that's not producing a lot of CO2. Sometimes just physically mixing the cells, kind of doing that pump over as we saw with the Samuel Smith Brewery in the, in the open fermenter. Something like that can help rouse the cells, agitate them, and get the cells actually into fermentation so they can start doing their thing. These are all options. And the important thing here is that if we do this checkup 24 hours in, we have the ability to make decisions to fix it. If we don't, Say we wait 72 to 96 hours. The fusels have been produced. Most sugars have been consumed. Most of the esters are set. The off flavors are probably produced at this point. We're kind of stuck. There isn't much we can do at this point. 24 hours in allows us to make decisions that can improve the trajectory of this beer. If we wait longer, we're, we're kind of SOL. Now, second most important check, if I were to have one, I would, I would argue that you should have one, but obviously there's always limitations for breweries, and then, you know, limit, there's limitations for everyone. Not, that's not a knock. Um, it would be right near the end of fermentation. Now, how do you know you're near the end of fermentation? I would argue you can do a forced fermentation test, which is very simple. Um, if you want to learn more about that, you can see our presentation, No Lab, No Problem webinar. Essentially, you need a mason jar. Uh, if we notice diacetyl, again, to do the forced diacetyl test, you can see that same, that same webinar. Keep it warm, let the thing raise up in temperature. There's things we can now do to check this to make sure that we don't have this problem. If you notice acetaldehyde, this one can be a bit trickier to, to handle. Um, you can increase the temperature to try and increase reuptake. You can often transfer the beer, and the reason behind this is thought to be that as you transfer, you see small amounts of yeast, so a small amount of oxygen pick up. That can then aerate the yeast cells, causing them to get more energy to pick up this diacetyl. Um, you can also, in doing so, re, uh, resuspend the yeast cake, helping the yeast cells become get in higher contact with, uh, with the new cells. I've also seen some breweries have, have success by, if they're transferring their beer from tank A to tank B to try and pick up diacetyl, adding the same yeast strain culture, kind of almost a sacrificial culture, to the next tank, hoping that the new yeast cells that are in that tank will reuptake the diacetyl and then settle out and die. Uh, it's a little bleak, but it also works. Um, it's worked a, I've seen it work a, few, a handful of times. And with that, there's kind of a final like thoughts on this before we get to the, the Q&A. Uh, these are some things that you can do to get on the naughty list, and I've seen all of these. Um, the first one, and this is 
what kind of what's inspired this slide because I couldn't find anywhere else to put it uh, is cone to cone cropping. And what I mean by this is putting a hose between two ferment fermenters um, and opening the valves and hoping that enough yeast transfers from tank A to tank B to inoculate it. Uh, in this case, you have no idea how much has been added, uh, if any, which I've seen that happen. Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't work. You have no idea to to know. You have no understanding of how many yeast cells have transferred. Uh, to give you sorry to, to riff on that example of no cells transferred, I mentioned beforehand about yeast cells if they've been overcrashed, where you can open the bottom of the valve and nothing comes out. If that is how you are cone to cone cropping, which is this scenario here, and you open the valve and nothing comes out, but it's a sealed valve that's unhooked to the other tank, you have no way of knowing that nothing is coming out. Uh, and then two or three days later, you notice that there's no, ferment no fermentation activity occurring on that tank, and it's infected with something environmental and smells like hell. This is not a good thing for you to do, uh, and I would not recommend you do it at all. Um, please don't do that. Uh, other things, mixing yeast cells in open fermentation or any sort of brink by hand. I have seen brewers try to take yeast clumps and then crush them in their hands to try and homogenize them. This is a great contamination hazard, and you should not do that. Um, not transferring open fermented ales into an aging tank near the end of ferment. This will just cause your beer to oxidize and turn not great. Um, and finally, adding oxygen to your wort without adding yeast. You are just at this point literally oxidizing your beer. Um, you should never do this. If there's not yeast cells present, there's no reason to add that. And one kind of just thing to, to mention on this, and this is something that I always find my students at least at the college um, kind of get blown away a little bit with. The goal of aerating our wort is not, and this will come up in the next talk we, I gave on oxygen, uh, the goal of aerating the wort is not to aerate the wort. It's to provide oxygen for the yeast cell that is, inhabits the wort. Um, if you start going to larger, some larger facilities, they won't actually aerate the wort. They'll aerate their yeast culture because that's the thing they actually want to have the oxygen to it. You know, you're trying to you're trying to provide oxygen to the yeast. You're not trying to provide oxygen to the beer. If you are not adding yeast, there is no reason for you to add oxygen to your beer. If you're just if you're doing your first cast out uninoculated, you should not be adding oxygen because there's no yeast cells present. It's kind of simple as that. And with that, in closing, um, yeast can be as simple as yeast handling can be as simple as complicated as you want it. Um, I hope this kind of give you some of the good do's and don'ts, kind of the some nuances or, or some kind of core rudiments of yeast handling that will help you make better decisions inside your facility. Now, how you design your facility, whether or not you design it for open fermentation or CCP fermentation, is up to you to a certain degree. And how you handle your yeast cells is going to be based on how you design your facility. You, it's not wise to take an open, sorry, a CCV fermented facility and try to turn it into a, into a top cropping facility. Um, that's not something you're designed for. It's going to go badly. Uh, one, I, I saw a brewery do this, tried to do this. I think they did two ferments with it, where essentially the, the blow-off arm for all their tanks was one inch. So it's quite small. But they were trying to do an open ferment. So they, they filled these fermenters near to the brim so that anything, much like the swan necks you see in the Burton system, um, any sort of excess yeast would pool over and get collected in a bucket. The issue here is that that yeast cell very quickly coats the small ID of this tube, and next thing you know, creates a plug, and then would either rocket a bunch of pressurized yeast into their brink, spraying yeast everywhere, or just pressurize the vessel to an ungodly point where the process control valve is then going off, spraying yeast everywhere. And if that failed because it got clogged full of yeast, it would have just created a bomb. Uh, this is not something I would recommend you do. You have to have your facility designed for the stuff first. Um, you should not try to retrofit equipment or try to use a CCV equipment with uh, top cropping. It's it's not going to end well. And please, I would highly recommend you don't don't do that. Um, set yourself up for success. Don't try to fight with it. And with that, we're we're done. Uh, we do have two more talks for this year. Uh, we have a webinar on November 24th, so quite soon, on brewery contamination sampling. That'll be with Richard and Louisa. I won't be there for that one. And then on December 8th. Uh, we'll talk about oxygen in the brewing and why it matters. I may not be here for that one because I may have an infant here. But if that's the case, Rich will take over for us. Uh, and with that, we'll get to the questions.
All right. <laughs> Great work, Nate. Learned a lot. Uh, hopefully that was helpful to, uh, to everyone here. Uh, hoping to learn a little bit more about yeast cropping. It is, you know, one of the things that uh, we get questions about the most. Um, and I think it was great to, to get this content together. Um, for those who are asking, we will definitely upload this onto oh, yeah. our YouTube channel. Um, try to get all that content onto there. Um, so make sure you check that out. You can see all of our past webinars as well. There's like 20 something hours of content at this point. So if you want to hear us talking about yeast for <laughs> almost a whole day, you can if you if you want. Um, with that, we're going to get into some of the questions. Um, the top voted question right now is, will additives like Biofine or Clarity Firm affect yeast health and repitching? That is something I have oft often wondered. Um, most of those are, are silicon-based or uh, silicon-based substances, uh, which might potentially cause some differences on that. We, we're actually doing a little bit of a study on this. Uh, internally, because we use any foam in our process, and we we're trying to figure out whether or not this would cause alterations in growth or handling or things like that. And, and from what we've seen, there does seem to be some variability to it, but we don't understand the mechanism behind it. Um, what I can guess is that different anti foams might increase or decrease the binding of oxygen or CO2 associated with so we might, with more antiform or more biofine or things that we might see less CO2 inside a solution, which may enhance the ability, the access of oxygen present or something like that. Um, I have never heard of anyone commercially for commercially having issues by adding biofine, excuse me, or antifoam to a beer. Um, not saying it's not possible, but I have never experienced anything like that. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of any any you know uh, problems that have really been traced to that. Um, no. From what I understand, you know, a lot of those fining agents like Biofine can, can actually be good for the yeast because it can help yep. them to flock out and, and collect more of that. Um, the other, yeah, the other one they were asking about was Clarity Firm, which actually, I, I I'm, believe I'm not sure if that's an enzyme or if that's just a... Um, most of those aren't enzymatic. Most of those okay. are, are uh, settling agents. They're, you know, they're either okay. tannic acid der derivatives or silicon derivatives. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I buy off on a tank once and could not get the next batch of beer to ferment. Huh. Well, yeah, I mean, it certainly can help with flocculation. So you might have a situation where that yeast could get, you know, I mean, the, the downside of flocculation is sometimes yeast flock so much that they get stuck to the sides of the tank, right? Which is where things like rousing come in handy. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is what I think would make sense for us to look into a little bit more. Hey, Mike, by the way, how's it going? Um, I've I've never heard of anyone having issues with biofine for it other than other than right now, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what Clarita Firm is. Apparently, it's an enzyme, but yeah, we, we don't. Uh, one of our one of our big competitors sells that product, so I apologize for our our ignorance on it. We don't <laughs> sell it. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> Oh, one of the questions was about uh, how a microbrewery can get into top cropping. I think we covered uh, some of that as well. Yeah, the, the big of, thing uh, I, I, I really just want to stress for the open fermenting thing is that please do not try to use standard bottom cropping designed vessels for this. It's a really bad idea. Uh, it's a really bad idea. Um, Please don't use that. On uh, There's a Facebook group called Milk the Forklift that yes. uh, a good number <laughs> of industry folks are in. And I saw someone posted a picture of a 100-barrel open-top conical fermenter uh, that was for sale. And it, it, it's the, one of the craziest things I've seen. It makes, it makes very little sense to me. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand it. I don't understand. I don't it know at if all. you saw that. I did. I didn't understand it at all. <laughs> uh, this is just going back to the Clarifirm thing, and this is just me. This is a lot of assumptions in here, so please do not by any means take this as gospel. Um, it looks just to be some sort of protease, so it just looks to be especially able to break down medium chain proteins such as you know haze causing proteins and gluten, which both of which kind of we often classify as medium chain proteins. Um, I don't think that would do a large amount of damage to yeast cells. Now, if your yeast cell was already stressed out, it would probably enhance that stress. Uh, but that would probably be about it. Now, a weird potential side effect of that would be that oftentimes when, well, all times when enzymes break down medium chain proteins, they break them into smaller bits, which is why they're broken down. 
Um, those smaller bits could theoretically be fan or yeast food. Um, could theoretically. Again, I am I am just I am making a lot of assumptions here, but that doesn't seem like something that would cause problems to me. Mm -hmm. Not yeah, serious by any means. I it don't may think it would cause issues. Yeah, it may enhance it may enhance prior problems, but I don't think it would. Yeah. Had this question come up uh, a few times in the past. Uh, is there any even modestly practical way to bottom crop off a flat bottom tank? Oh, okay. A um, shovel. <laughs> seen, seen that if you have a side manway, that does kind of work. Yeah. Um, kind of. Uh, if you do the whole thing where you take your yeast cells off the beer first, that can be a better way to do it, and then rouse with sterile gas. That can be a way to get some. Um, I've also seen one brewery where I believe they were recirculating mm -hmm. sterile cold water, sterile cold water inside of it to try and pull uh, yeast cells out of it. Um, I had to do this once, and it was a horrible two days, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I would add is, you know, I spent a little bit of time with uh, the folks at Live Oak Brewing in Austin, and they don't really have conical vessels. They have horizontal, uh, like, lagering tanks, but they, they ferment in them as well. So yeast cropping for them is emptying the tank and then going in with a, with a sanitized shovel and shoveling out yeast. Uh, <laughs> so it can be done. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm, it's labor intensive. I'm thinking Grundy's and things like that, like small tanks that you can't walk into. But yeah, yeah if you could walk into yeah. it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, just looking at Kevin's uh, statement. Hey, Kevin, by the way. Uh, having issues with diacetyl uptake and clarifirm. That's, that's interesting. Well, if you have excess, like it, it could result in an excess of fan, which might oh, then... Which make diastole more of an issue. Yeah, that would make sense. That would make lots of sense. That would be my guess. Is it effective to crop yeast before dry hopping uh, around two Plato before final gravity? It can be, and that's what you see a lot of the NEPA breweries do. Um, mm -hmm. I would recommend that you try to partially cold crash it before that. Now, an important thing to note here is that, so uh, on average, and this is always strain specific and things like that, if I add 10 trillion cells into fermentation, I'm going to roughly get 40 trillion cells out. I roughly see a 4xing of cell biomass under fermentation conditions. Now, for us, for bioreactors and things like that, we see a much larger number, but we're trying to produce cells, not yeast. So keep that in mind. Um, mm -hmm. If you do this where you're going to be cropping your yeast cells earlier in the ferment, so like before FG is hit, you're not going to get the 4x amount of yeast cells. You will get probably 1 to 2x what you added in. Now, the issue a lot of NEPA brewers face is that because a lot of these strains are English, direct, uh, English derived, which means they often flock pretty hard, it can be very difficult to get these cells out. So if you go 1 to 1, if you can get just the amount of cells that you added into the tank, even 2 to 1, that's phenomenal. For this method, That's you're winning. Um, you should not assume you're going to get a four to one ratio of yeast cells harvested to inoculation if you're harvesting before FG and cold crashing have, have occurred. It's not gonna happen. Um, this is where you see breweries, where I would recommend breweries implement the second method though, where you transfer the beer off the, off the cake and then collect the full cake. Um, that way you get the full amount of yeast cells off of, out of the fermenter. So if you do need a larger volume of yeast cells, say you're trying to grow up, a, say, a 10-heck pitch into a 40-heck pitch for the next batch, that is a way to do it, and a way to assure, ensure that you're going to get the cell biomass. Yeah, the only thing I would add there is, um, ideally, I would want that beer to pass a forced diacetyl test before cropping the yeast, because if, if it's still got uh, potential for diacetyl in it and you're removing some of the, the yeast biomass, then that beer is going to have a harder time cleaning up diacetyl. Yep. So <laughs> it's a it's a balancing act. Yeah, you're, you're, it's a fermentation of those beers seems pretty straightforward, but it's actually kind of tricky. Mm -hmm. What would be the minimum viability to still consider repitching? That's, that's, a, that's a risk tolerance question. Yeah. Um, I personally wouldn't want to use anything below 85% viability. Um, I would feel very comfortable around like 90, very comfortable around 90. Mm -hmm. um, 
if if you were at 85, 80, I would be on kind of high alert and I'd start looking at ways to, you know, maybe alter my cropping methods, uh, refresh this yeast, do something like that. Now, I am very aware that that statement comes probably with a high degree of bias because I own a yeast company. <laughs> Uh, but it, it really comes down to risk tolerance. So if you have found that you can work with 80% viability quite happily, I'm not going to say that you're doing it wrong. Uh, if that's what's working well for you, don't you know? Don't change it if it's not broken. Don't fix it if it's not broken. That's it. Um, if if you're not happy with the results, then look at changing it. Uh, if you want to try, try and get more generations out of it, look at potentially changing it. Yeah. But I would not. Uh, I personally shoot for 80, 80, sorry, 85. I wouldn't want to go lower, but if you're, what you're doing works is working. Keep on, keep on doing the thing that works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only thing I would add there is, is, you know, it can also depend on the yeast. Some yeasts yep. are, you know, just really tolerant of kind of getting beat up a little bit. So Saison's and no, a Saison yeast, I would be totally comfortable with a lower viability, but if I'm, um, pitching or repitching a, a lager yeast or foggy London or something like that, Vermont, uh, I would want it to be pretty high viability because that, that tends to be where you start to see some problems. Yep. Uh, what, one other thing just to mention on this, and this is, I, I meant to mention it during the presentation, but there's a lot of content in there. Um, if you were in the situation where you can crop new cells and kind of forego and discard the cells you had cropped in the fridge and that doesn't cause any sort of other complications, I would do that. I would never get in the situation of like, hey, I'm going to eat the steak that's one week old so that the steak that's two days old is fresher. Um, a first in, first out system doesn't necessarily always pan out for yeast handling. Yeah. Uh, you want to use the freshest cell you possibly can as long as it's not going to alter your inventory of culture for other fermentations. Yeah, one hundred percent. I agree with that. Yeah, use the best yeast, not <laughs> yeah. not the oldest yeast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because healthy yeast is going to make a bunch more yeast in a in a few days, right? So exactly. you can you can get more. Will spunding or bunging, so having some back pressure on a tank, uh, have a negative impact on yeast health? And how can brewers crop and repitch lager yeast effectively? Uh, Okay, there's a few things to go on there. So spunding or the, the increased head pressure does not seem to have a large amount of adverse effects on the yeast culture. Um, it will have more impact if your cells are low health to begin with. Um, it, it can be that thing, that, you know, it can be the needle on the haystack. That the, sorry, not the needle, the last straw on the haystack that breaks the camel's back. There's a statement in there. It's been a long day. Yeah, we're, we're mixing metaphors here. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long day. I'm sorry about that. Um, so yeah, it, it can highlight other issues that are that were underlying, but the pressure itself won't cause a problem. Um, pressure can though cause an increase in flocculation to occur or early flocculation to occur. Uh, so in that case, you probably want to crop yourself potentially a bit earlier. And when it comes to harvesting yeast cells in a pressurized vessel, it's fairly straightforward. Um, you know, you, you just want to make sure, much like with Cali or things like that, you'll have to dial in your method when it comes to cold crashing. But it's it's not more complicated the only thing that i would mention in this because this can be very messy if you don't account for it is that you you probably want to back pressure your yeast brink so say if your fermenter has 10 psi on it and you do not back pressure your yeast brink meaning it has zero psi on it you are then taking carbonated yeast which that's literally what it is and then which which you know it's it's quite foamy it, it will retain it, it will maintain its volume and expand uh, you're then putting it into a zero PSI environment where it's going to rapidly expand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and your, say, normally one hectoliter yeast brink or two hect yeast brink will actually be holding maybe 10 liters of liquid and 40 liters of foam. <laughs> if you back pressure it, you shouldn't have this problem. Uh, as long as you address that problem, you're going to be pretty good. Uh, you just have to keep, you just have to kind of pressurize your brink or very slowly harvest things off of it or harvest your cells in a faster fashion than seal your brink up quickly <sighs> excuse me to manage that it, it's i would recommend starting with pressurizing your brink and taking it from there and then slowly like 
slowly, say your, your fermenter's at 10, your break should be at 8. Slowly let it transfer in so it doesn't just foam everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can also do if you're, if you're looking to, say, spuns at near the end of ferment is har try to harvest yeast cells before you start spunding. Um, that's also an easy, an easy way to do it. 100%. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we've certainly seen our share of foamy yeast crops and, and had to troubleshoot that one. Yep. <laughs> uh, do you recommend not to crop yeast after a certain ABV, a certain alcohol content? This is strain specific. So if you're talking about kvikes, I don't think it matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're talking lagers, I definitely think it matters. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going with a lot of English ale strains, it matters less. Belgian ale strains probably matters less as well. Um, North American style ales, I'm kind of on the fence with. I probably wouldn't go anything higher than like six. There's some weird genetics with those things that just make leave me questioning them. Um, yeah, I, I, I within reason, but I, I would I don't go extreme. Don't go like twelve percent pastry stouts or things like that. Um, yeah, and anything below six percent, I probably wouldn't be worried about. There are a few strains that I mentioned the Kvikes again that I probably wouldn't want to crop cells from things that are below five percent, just because they require a higher nutrient content than other yeast strains. Yeah, got to make sure the yeast is fed. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. And yeah, higher gravity, higher gravity can be okay for the yeast as long as it's getting the the nutrition it needs, right? Like one of the thing, you know, some of the things that help yeast with handling those higher gravity ferments are uh, some of the vitamins that come from the malt and uh, some of the minerals that come from the water. Uh, magnesium, for example, higher magnesium content can uh, really help yeast uh, uh, might otherwise struggle with high alcohol contents. So um, a lot of sort of the, the nutrient inputs can impact this, this question a lot. Yeah. Uh, as a follow up to this, we got Kevin asking about SO5. SO5 is pretty bulletproof. Um, like you can bring, I, I got that six, 7% rule. I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't have any issue with, um, mm -hmm. anything over seven. I would start being a little worried. Now, again, the higher the ABV on this, I like, if you start going North of six, I would start wanting, I, I'd be, I'd be wanting to use that strain very quickly. I wouldn't want to store it for a long period of time because those stress might, you know, materials over a longer period of time. Uh, one thing we didn't touch on is the beer that the, that the yeast cell is immersed in, um, if you are going to be storing, say, the culture for a longer period of time, you probably should shoot for a lower nutrient, sorry, a lower ABV beer. And in some cases, it might make sense to supplement nutrient, like supplement nutrients to the yeast cells as they age. That way, there's they have available nutrients to them for long-term storage. Um, if you have a high ABV beer, that's probably going to cause some damage, and it's probably going to stress itself out. Um, what I mentioned about macro breweries and kind of large scale yeast brinks and things like that. This isn't very common anymore, but I know at one point they, they were looking at this stuff where they would essentially wash the yeast a la home brewing style uh, to try and remove the beer. Uh, there's the alcohol content from, from the yeast cells because they're mainly brewing high gravity. They're going 7 to 10% ABV as their base. So they'd be adding sterile water to it to thin that alcohol out so that the yeast cells would be less stressed during storage. Um, that's very complicated and probably far well outside the realm of possibility for the average craft brewery. But that is something that some people have played around with, with some success. Yeah. Uh, with the caution that if you, if you replace too much of the liquid with water, then, then you're actually diluting whatever residual, um, pH buffers and nutrients are in there and, and, and it can be detrimental to the yeast. Yeah. And I know some people have played around with adding oils and things like that to yeast cells for longer term storage. There are some things you can do to help, um, you know, g provide a nutrient content to the yeast cells for longer term storage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are the risks for bacteria and Brett contamination on repitching? Maybe uh, that comes into our next webinar. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good. We'll address that in the next webinar. The mm -hmm. Coles notes is is they're always there. Um, yeah. It all depends. It just heavily depends on how you operate your facility and what the risks, how you mitigate the risks that the environment poses to you. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's a case where you know understanding what those different microbes thrive in, uh, what kind of environments they thrive in, and how to monitor for them uh, becomes really important, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, even if we're looking at repitching yeast, there's certain certain contaminants that might be uh, more stressful. 
or, or, or more more risky than others, right? Like yeah. uh, Brett, for example, is not a common contaminant outside of wood cellars, right? It, it's something that shows up in in barrels a lot, but but not really in other environments. But then other contaminants like lactic acid bacteria and diastatic yeast show up all the time in in stainless uh, fermented and aged beer. So yeah, yeah it's wonderful. all about knowing where these things, who who these characters are and, and where they like to hide one one thing i would love to do this pro will probably come up in the the next webinar is just horror stories about where organisms have hidden that's uh <laughs> oh yeah oh boy <laughs> it's, yeah we, we haven't sorted out the full structure for that but it is very much like a you know fantastic beasts and where to find them you know <laughs> what's uh what's hiding in your co2 lines what's hiding in your hoses <laughs> Uh, some real world, uh, you know, battle stories from 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 the trenches. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we found an arrow tolerant di di sorry, uh, pediococcus. Crap. <laughs> oh, all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the only other question that I see here is uh, if you have an old yeast brink, can it be revived? To viability or should it be tossed a yeast brink an old yeast brink <laughs> uh, i guess it depends on how old it is and send, how... me a, send me a picture and i can let you know yeah <laughs> um yeah i i do want to kind of point this out that a lot of people think that the yeast brinks have to be super scientific and i know that might sound somewhat odd coming from someone who is yeast focused uh, but they don't have to be complicated. Uh, you know, there, there's, from an engineering standpoint, keep it simple. It doesn't have to be this large, you know, complicated device. It, it's a, a few ports, some CO2, the ability to say, emerge, immerse the entire thing in PAA. You can, you can make some real simple devices work really well. Mm -hmm. um, it does not need to be complicated. Mm -hmm. it, it really depends on what you're trying to do with it. Yeah. And in terms of, of old yeast in a brink, it's it's tricky because in you again, it, this is where it comes down to checking some of the data, right? Like yeah. if you've got a yeast in a brink and it's been a month or six weeks in there, definitely recommend doing a viability check to see where it's at. And, and if it's looking low and you really don't want to get new yeast, then, you know, you could try doing a, you know, a small prop or feeding it, but at the end of the day, like feeding a yeast crop nutrients isn't going to bring the dead cells back to life, right? No. So once they're dead, they're dead. This is something I was trying to weave into the talk, and I, I couldn't find a good place to put it, so this mm -hmm. this will do. Um, so you oft, you kind of hear about breweries, you know, back in the day using their yeast culture for 200 years consistently or something like that. They'd never gotten a lab pitch or something like that. And, you know, they're, they're just repitching, 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 repitching. Um, this is, these are often top cropping breweries or, or breweries that are using yeast cells that have not got, not cold crashed or things like that. They're usually breweries that have kept the yeast cells consistently highly fermented of the entire duration of that time. The yeast cell changes though. It's not the same, I, you know, exactly the same flavor profile organism. It's going to drift. And one of the biggest ways you see this drift is, um, uh, sorry, I just noticed some people in the comments talking about other breweries at top crop and things like that. If you have old yeast in a brink, you can probably bring those cells back to life. Like we have done some arche sometimes arch feels like archaeology when it comes to try and get bottle get dregs of organisms out of you know a small culture and you get like a culture or two two cult two colonies. And yeah. that, that's a success. Um, that culture is one of the remnants of the population that was left. That doesn't mean that it's representative of that initial culture. So if you have a yeast brink full of a culture that's really old, um, it might, it'll still, you probably can get some yeast cells out of it, but they may not be reflective of the initial culture. Just something to be aware of. You may have seen drift. You may have actually artificially selected for something. Um, the DNA may have been damaged over that long storage period. So what you get out isn't what you put in initially all that time ago. It, these things can happen surprisingly quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Yeah, I think that's a that's a totally valid point. I mean, yeast evolution is always happening. It's happening in our breweries, especially when we reuse yeast and you know recognize that it you know, yeast cell that's grown from a colony in a lab and then you know through multiple generations and then used in a brewery through multiple generations uh, is going to go through you know a lot of divisions and uh, you know in the process of creating that many trillions of yeast cells, you can uh, get a measurable uh, amount of mutation, um, and there's been some more, you know, recent science done on on actually tracking this, and, and a really cool paper that's coming out from some folks at University of Washington where they uh, tracked uh, California ale strain over generations of repitching, and you know, found that there are genetic changes that occur and that are even predictable because they've happened in several different lines of. The, that sort of California ale strain in several several different places, uh, and we we contributed some some material to that as well, like a Cali ale that had been repitched by a brewery thirty six times, um, and you can see those changes, you know, from the lab, uh, you know, stock strain to that yeast after it's been used for a bunch of generations. You know, whether that's good or bad, there's there's changes. Yeah, and what, what the uh, yeah, the, I, I'm really excited for this. There's, there's it's really cool things that are coming out in regards to yeast genetics, and I would go on a twenty-minute conversation about this. So it's now is not the time. <laughs> yeah, there's more to come for sure. Yeah, more to come for later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're at uh, an hour and a half. Uh, I think uh, I think we can call it quits for tonight. Uh, Sounds good. Uh, as we said, we're going to have another webinar uh, at the end of this month. We're going to be talking about. Uh, common brewery contaminants and sampling plants. So what are the, uh, the common spoilage organisms in beer? And then how can we actually come up with a plan to check for them, monitor for them? Uh, and we'll try to have some examples for, you know, someone at home, uh, small brewery and medium and large breweries. Yeah, th those things always, uh, people are always surprised that the things that affect a brew pub aren't the same things that affect a uh, macro lager producer. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us, and I hope you guys learned a little bit and can help uh, help you guys make some better beer. Have a good evening, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>